Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it is the 24th of September, 2012. And Nickel Goyle is our guest tonight, our special guest. His book is One Size Does Not Fit All. Nickel, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. We're really delighted. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for support. Peggy's asking if he can see the chat or if he's only on the phone. He is only on the phone, but I'll relay any chat to him. I'm currently on my Hack Your Education tour, hackyoureducation.com, uh, holding small community discussions around education in different cities to see how people respond and what kind of conversations make a difference for them. It's a lot of fun. You can see the schedule of hackyoureducation.com. I would love to have you. Sounds like there's a sound issue. I don't know. I think we lost the teleconference bridge. That must be what happened. Hang on, we'll see if it comes back. That one is not available. At the tone, oh, no. please record your message. We'll try again. When you have finished recording, you may Sounds hang like up or press 1 for more on options. Or something happened to his phone. I'll keep going. I don't know where you lost me, but I think the, my audio cut out when teleconference bridge went down. But anyway, I'm on the Hack Your Education tour. Go to hackyoureducation.com and have some fun with us. The Library 2.012 conference is this coming week. Not this current week, but the next week, sorry, October 3rd through 5th. It's going to be a blast. I hope you can join us for some of that. And then the Global Education Conference, November 12th to 16th. 150 sessions for the Future of Libraries Conference. That is closed now for presentations, but if you still want to submit a presentation for the Global Education Conference, you can do so. Let me try connecting on the teleconference bridge again. Are you back? Sorry about that. Yeah, if we don't know what I don't know if it was our side or yours, but we're glad to have you back. Thanks. Coming up on the future of education tomorrow night, Ron Rich Hart talks about his book Making Thinking Visible. Wednesday night, a really fun event, the true history of the MOOC. Dave Cormier, Alec Coro, Stephen Downs, Rita Kopp, George Siemens, Inga Devard, and Carol Yeager should be a blast. Thomas Vander Ark comes on to talk about his book, Getting Smart. I wanted to talk to him for a long time. We'll see how that goes. The Library 2.01 conference, uh, Kirsten Olson is going to talk about her book, Wounded by School. Blake Bowles will talk about Better Than College. Denise Pope from Stanford on Challenge Success. Susie Boss. Anyway, lots more coming up. Hopefully something of value to you. If you've missed any of the sessions, they are all recorded. We're up to over 300 shows. Bob Glinner and Dana McCauley talked to us last week about place-based education. One of the smallest audiences I've ever had for a webinar and one of the most interesting and intriguing and valuable topics. I sometimes feel there's an inverse correlation. Anyway, they did a great job and it was really fun to, to hear from them. Uh, Charles Fidel before that talked about uh, what skills students should know in the 21st century. And Jamie Vollmer talked about um, schools cannot do it alone in his famous Blueberry story. Anyway, lots and lots all recorded on the futureofeducation.com site in full Blackboard Collaborate form and in Illuminate MP3. I am seeing an audio slowdown um, for many of you. And if you're hearing me sound like Mickey Mouse, that's because the audio is catching up. This is where you can indicate where you're listening from. 
If you look to the left of the map, you'll see some icons. You're looking for the star icon, the second one down on the left. Click on that and then click on the map. I'm currently in sunny Seattle for the Hack Your Education Tour. Seattle, Washington. Feel free to post in the chat where you're listening from. And I'm seeing a pretty consistent slowdown, which worries me that it could be my connection. So I'm going to... Let's see. So I apologize for that. I switched wireless network. At the hotel that I'm at, I'm hoping this would be better. I do have to bring the keel back on. So intriguingly, with both my cellular broadband connection and the wireless at the hotel, I keep getting bumped off. So let's try one more time. See if we can get the keel back, the keel back on. Three nine six three seven one is not available. Add a tone. You are a patient audience if you put up with all of this. When you recording, you may hang up or press one for more options. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there, but I will try him again in just a second. I did create a mighty bell room for this session. I'll put the link in the chat here. Mighty Bell is the content and curation and conversation project by Gina Bianchini, the co-creator of Ning. This is her new project. It is really a lot of fun. I do consult for Gina. So it, in full disclosure, this is a project that I'm working on for her. But I love it. So this is the link for the One Size Fits All room. There you go. And well, let's try and bring him back on the line. Hey, Steve. Yeah, I, I don't know what's wrong with connection. Are you back? <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's me. I think it may well have been me. I've switched. To, well, I've switched to a different wireless connection here at the hotel that I'm at, and it seems to be better, although I'm still seeing different slowdowns okay. from the audience members. So we'll do the best we can. Thanks for being patient. We've gone through all the introductory material, and we're now back with you. Um, it's been an so, interesting. Uh, how has experience. Education Nation um, been? It's now they have the student town hall, uh, the teacher town hall, but I think the main problem with Education Nation is that they don't have much representation from people who are progressive in nature who and who have different viewpoints. So it's very corporate based. Um, and it's troubling me, for example, on the student uh, parenting engagement panel, and there weren't really any real parents that had any very valid opinions. Um, they just had one parent who supported the parent trader, but they didn't have anybody else who offered a differing viewpoint. Um, so it's been very one-sided in general. We are hearing you, and thank you for that. But, um, you're a little bit soft. If you have any ability to speak up, that would help, but don't worry if you don't. We'll 
do the best that we can. So this is not new to Education Nation, though, right? I mean, the same criticisms were voiced pretty vocally last year. Is it just the case that they're tone deaf to um, anything outside of the kind of corporate tradition? You know, I, I actually don't really understand why they have this such a one sided I mean, I understand in a sense that their sponsors are of corporations, the Kellogg, the Gates Foundation, um, uh, Jeff Bezos. They, these are corporate, corporate sponsors. However, um, I in the people they, they pick, I mean, it's just it's ludicrous. They, they didn't include a lot of the key players in the education conversation, like um, Deborah Meyer and Ravitch. Um, and there are a lot of phenomenal and very important voices that need to be heard, but they're not even present. However, they have the student town hall this year, um, which was a huge, huge, huge step in the right direction. But that student town hall was only right in the beginning. and, and in the rest of the program, for the rest uh, other two days, there weren't any students on any panel whatsoever. Um, so that was a huge problem. I'm guessing that uh, many of the people you quote in the book don't get invited as well, right? I mean, some of the yeah. uh, the voices that come from the you know the democratic movement, the arrows kind of. Uh, cadre of speakers. Yeah, they don't even have any voice whatsoever. Okay, so uh, I think that will play into our conversation a little. Um, uh, am I right in per perceiving that this has been a year-long project for you, the book? Yes. Um, so it started. I started writing the book um, in September of 2012, um, and I basically started research at the beginning of that year, so January 2011, um, and just started doing interviews, doing a lot of research, reading as many books as possible on the subject, um, and then compiling all together. You're going in and out a little for me. Thanks for being patient. Thanks, everybody, for, for putting up with uh, the tenuous situation. But I, I think we'll keep going and, and hope that uh, it stays at I'll least I'll be Wi-Fi soon. Okay, good. Hey, so uh, uh, I'm curious also about, so uh, you've got the book listed on Amazon, but uh, I went to the Arrow page. Is Arrow the publisher? Yes, um, Arrow is the publisher. Um, it's, it was just recently released also on the Kindle. Um, yeah. So Arrow, you know, carries with it a certain perspective on education. You know, I think a lot of the people you talk to sort of fit into that same category. Did you end up interviewing anybody who disagreed with you significantly? And um, and if so, how did you sort of resolve those differences? Um, yeah, I interviewed a number of different people um, that were not necessarily in my viewpoints. For example, um, I interviewed the former superintendent of Boston schools, um, and and what I did, even though I didn't necessarily include their perspective on the issue, um, they, I, I mean, I, I wanted to reach out to as many schools as possible um, in the conversation. Do you have a sense? In terms of the interviews that you held and the kind of responses that you get um, as you go around and talk about sort of how big the echo chamber is, I mean, how many people are looking at this progressively versus kind of the larger education nation kinds of efforts? Um, yeah, I, I what I had at least in the sense of the interviews was to, I mean, the way. It, it really started uh, off on how to find the people to interview. It really began with just compiling a lot of research um, and going from there um, and talking to them, reaching out, and then really putting it all together. So I, I try to get a lot of diverse opinions on curriculum, on, on testing, et cetera. 
Nikhil, it's really hard to hear you, and I'm worried that we've got several people leaving the room, and I think they're doing so because the audio quality is so low. Um, are you in a position you think things are going to get better, or maybe we should reschedule? Um, I should be able to be in my time in the next two or three minutes. And then would you come into the collaborate room, or would you still be on your phone? Yes. Yeah, I'll be on the collaborate room. Okay. So thanks, folks, for, for sticking with us. We'll keep going here. So um, I'm still kind of curious as to what degree you think the viewpoints in the book are reflective of larger perceptions, or um, if you're able to kind of quantify in any way um, how much your your viewpoint is held by others, and and how much of the education nation kind of viewpoint is the is the norm. Um, I think a lot of the people in uh, the in, in the book, at least, they hold many similar perspectives to me, um, but some of them do not. I mean, we don't agree on everything. Um, in education nation standpoint, um, there are a lot of people who don't necessarily agree with me on a lot of things, but it's funny. Um, I'll bring up a conversation I had with um, Dennis, Tapp, uh, Dennis Walcott. Um, I talked to him about, uh, when I was on NBC this, this Sunday, I talked to him about uh, a lot of these issues, and he agreed with me, considering even though that his policies have really been against everything I'm talking about. Um, so I think people are people are pretty receptive that we shouldn't have a, a, lot, of, a lot of this testing that's going on. We shouldn't be pushing um, for schools that simply don't work, uh, and we have to support teachers. And that's really common sense principles that I think a lot of people will agree with. So one of the, the sort of conversations we continue to have is So it looks like we lost connection again. Hopefully he's close to Wi-Fi. Uh, hey, Steve, I'll be on Wi-Fi in just a minute. Are you there? I'll be on Wi-Fi in just a minute. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be I'm glad sorry about that. Okay. No, no, no. Don't, don't worry. We'll, I'm not sure it's entirely you. So um, why don't you go ahead and hang up, get on the Wi-Fi. We'll okay. have a little conversation here and uh, wait for you to come on. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so knowing that he is a and I'm getting bumped out of the room again. <laughs> Jenny, I don't think that's the iPad app that's the problem right now for you. I think there's something wrong with this Blackboard Collaborate room um, because both um, Nikhil, are you there? Turn your mic on, you click on the talk button at the top left. Hi. Hey. Welcome back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Although I have dropped off this session myself about five times, so I'm not convinced that it's just you. I think there may be a problem with this particular session. Okay, no problem. Okay, so here was my question. Um, you know, you're, you've interviewed a lot of people who have um, really thoughtful perspectives on education. Uh, you know, the, the volume of quotes in your book attests to the fact that these are not new ideas. Uh, you know, your age is a significant factor here in the visibility of them again. But will they actually move the needle? meaning the political discourse really seems to be centered on accountability. 
have you thought about how this moves from kind of more beating of the chest to actual changes in policy? Yeah, um, I'm really happy to announce that I'm I'm really I'm going to be starting an organization that really brings some of the policies and ideas that I've advocated in the book um, to really the national scale. And that's what I'm planning on doing in the next few months, planning that process, putting the framework for that organization about. Because I think writing a book is great, but I want to put these policies into action and really bring the stakeholders in education together. Um, and I think that's such an important part to not just rant about it, but really put into action and, and use, use, some, use some words um, along with that. So there are many of us who are interested in um, sort of the progress of Aero and IDEA and other organizations. How will your plans be different from sort of those existing efforts? I think one of the problems that we I've noticed is that there are all these education groups out there, um, and I'm not describing them in any way. Um, I think they're doing some phenomenal work, but many of them are, are going school by school by school and they're trying to change the system or put alternative schools, and I think that's definitely fine, but if we take that approach, it'll take a generation longer to even put some um, important change. I always like to bring up um, what happened in the past decade. That we saw No Child Behind, Race to the Top, and other government policies really change almost every public school in the country. Um, they they brought more testing, and what you can agree with them or not, but they what they did is that they affected almost every single student and almost every single teacher. And we have to all that. We're losing your audio. Is your headset slipping? Um, can you hear me no, I can't hear you at all. This has got to be the Murphy's Law of Interviews. <laughs> We've done it. <laughs> We've encountered every possible obstacle. <laughs> is this better? It is way better. Okay. Um, like I was saying, um, I think we need to put these policies on the agenda. We need to have protests. We need to um, push policymakers to the point where they have to listen because there's, I know there's a, a strong, strong population of teachers, parents, students, um, and policymakers that really want to change the system. Um, it will take a while. But unless we come together, unless we put all these groups together and their ideas, then really not much will really make a difference. So I'm intrigued by one aspect of this conversation, which is that a, a young student um, takes time off, uh, assembles all of this uh, really phenomenal material, not only assembles it, but adds his own thoughtful voice to the conversation. And yet it feels as though the end result outcome is to change the system. And um, I, I'm intrigued by that because I would think that uh, you know, almost the conclusion might be that you come to that having a system in any form is always going to only represent a certain number of ways of viewing something. So how do you kind of reconcile your own independence with the desire to influence the system? Um, I think one of the things that I, I really do look at, um, and I really bring back from my personal experience as a student, um, I mean, I, I haven't, for example, these thoughts that I've been having, these ideas that I put in the book, um, they, I, I was thinking of the complete opposite years ago. I mean, if you, I was, I did all my homework, I did all my testing, I, I was a very good child, I was pretty obedient in many ways, um, and then a lot of it hit me. So I, I made that shift, thankfully, early on. Um, and some people just don't even make that shift in, sh shift in their entire lives. So I'm, I'm really trying to um, bring about my personal experience that I had. I mean, it, it takes a long time to realize what's occurring in public education, how um, you need to leverage these new passions. You need to treat children like adults. You need to have, um, you, ch you should be educating the whole child rather than just pigeonholing them into certain subjects. Um, it takes a while to understand, but the more people that talk about it, um, only then will we actually make some difference until we have parents on board um, and school administrators. 
So if you distinguish yourself from the kind of unschooling, homeschooling movement or someone like Dale Stevens, how do you see your perspective differently? Um, yeah, I, I, I really do support people who go into homeschooling and unschooling. I think they're phenomenal models. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think there's some really, I, I support on college in so many different ways that it's in the way that not everybody, not every kid should go to college. And I document that in the book as well. Um, how there are these, all these amazing um, paths and ideas people and programs people are going into. For example, the Teal Fellowship or Institute, um, which is a, a two-year apprenticeship program in New York City. There are so many amazing, amazing things that are occurring right now and we're finally taking advantage of them. And, and the more people that realize that you're getting into more debt or you're doing, you, you aren't learning that much in college, it's going to shift the tone and it's going to shift the conversation so that... Um, people in power are going to start realizing what's going on. So I'm interested in, uh, the, you interviewed Sugata Mitra, and, and I've, uh, he's been on this show as well, and one of the fascinating pieces of his work is kind of the importance of peers in the learning process. How much do you consider yourself an autodidact, and how much do you consider yourself a peer learner? Um, I think it's, I, I consider myself such a huge autodidact. I mean, I, I've been self-directing my learning for, for my entire life. I, I started reading when I was very young, and I, I read, I was, my mother always joked with me that I was always seen carrying around with a book in my hand, um, because I was. I mean, I, I would love learning. It was just so fascinating to me, and I continue that to this very date. Um, I, I, for example, my, I have a huge fascination and, and, um, and love for politics. And I didn't learn about that at all in school. They didn't, they didn't teach it to me. They didn't, um, they didn't expose it to me. But after I, I started following the news more, I started going to conferences um, and really understanding the political process in America, only then did I really truly love the, truly love the subject because it has to come from within. It has to, you have to be motivated not by some kind of reward but by your personal passion. So that does bring me back around kind of to this idea of a system because uh, reforming or changing the system will still probably involve policy agreement that provides a single perspective on education. And does that not then sort of create the same dilemma? Say that again, the, the first part. Well, so, so if you, if you, influence policy decisions and, and policies are changed related to schooling, then you still have a system which is going to have a perspective on education. And does that not place the, that whatever that next system is sort of in the same position as our current one, not necessarily right. reflecting the needs of all students or being something that is agreed to by everyone? Yeah, I think it's, I think one of the things I like to emphasize is that school needs to continue to adapt to its current, current age. I mean, the policies that we are, as many people have said before, are, we're in the industrial mindset and that really needs to be changed. Um, it needs to continue to reinvent itself um, and that's why I'm focusing on public education because there's so many, there's a lot of people that want to change the system and we have to continue to adapt over times. We have to, for example, there was a great study by Kathy Davidson and basically she, she found um, was that a majority, I don't know how, I think it was a majority of jobs um, haven't been created created yet. So our kids are going to be creating jobs. They're going to be inventing their own. They're going to be exploring and, and finding new paths for themselves. Um, so the system can will need to and will naturally um, adapt to that kind of style of thinking. I think if we if we start if we start now. Yeah, uh, this is a really fun conversation because this will be sort of the dilemma, right? Can you create a system that's self-reforming? that continues to right. adapt to change, um, or by its very nature, will a system always be resistant to change, and, and therefore is the answer a system? I, I'm kind of sort of trying to channel Noam Chomsky, thinking, you know, would, would he be in favor of a system, or would he be looking for a shift in the direction of who drives education? Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I spoke with Noam Chomsky, and, and he... Um, I, um, interestingly enough, actually has some very similar thoughts 
of mine under public education. I mean, he talks about the purpose of schooling and and how it's it's really just weeding out weeding out so many different types of kids who don't necessarily perform at that at level. Um, he talks about democracy. How the true purpose of public education is to create active and global citizens who are lifelong learners um, and who are not under this kind of submission and obedience style of thinking. Um, so Noam Chomsky is is a I support him in many different ways in that way, um, but it's an interesting conversation to have, at least on should we, re should we really get away with the system? Um, so I think that's a good question to pose. Well, good. So we'll keep going. I want to give you a chance to kind of tell the story of the book, although it's fun to hear your background on it. Um, uh, one more quick question before we sort of launch into some of the, the arguments of the book. When you meet somebody who has no idea what you're doing or who you are, and you start talking about education. Have you found common areas in which they respond with understanding to this message about schools? Uh, just sort of the regular person on the street, are there, are there parts of your conversation with them where you say, they really kind of get it if I tell them X, Y, or Z? Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really, really great question. Um, and when I talk to a lot of just people who are not necessarily connected in the education field, um, the thing that we always have some kind of, usually have some kind of common bond is that either they didn't like school, um, they had, they found some problem that we both talked about that was very similar, um, or they find their kids are being frustrated, are so frustrated, they have all this pressure, they're stressed out, there's so much homework, um, and that's a really important bond to make and that's where we should be going to because once you make it about their kids, their education, their frustrations, their stress, whether they're getting a job, then you make it personal. It needs to really be about the individual person and their opinions. Do you meet people who say, no, I'm really happy with the schools and my kids are excelling and this is what I want? Um, oh, yeah. I, I definitely hear that and I, I tell them. Um, so tell me, I usually ask the question, um, what, what do you think the purpose of public education is? I ask, usually ask them the question and, and the people who, who agree with what you were just saying um, say it's really to just get a job. And some people are pretty, um, pretty passionate in the sense that they should, their kids should go to college they should go through the, all the scholastic hoops. And I tell them, so what happens when, so I tell them the statistics about unemployment for college graduates. I tell them about how you should be, instead of just telling your kids what to do, to, to do and, and you should um, prescribe this path, why don't, you t ask, why don't you ask them what they really love to do and their person, and their, what they're passionate about. Um, it really comes down to their own children because most parents, they, they just tell the kid, you have to be a doctor, you've got to be a lawyer. Um, and that's really what kids listen to because they're drilled that from very early on. And they're not, they're not um, encouraged, most kids are not encouraged to think about something else, to do something other than the norm until they see some other pe some kids who are rebellious or um, against the status quo. Okay, so you certainly don't spare anybody in your criticisms in the book. And I think they're, you know, highly accurate and fascinating descriptions of circumstances. You particularly kind of drill down on our um, idealizing of China and India and Finland. Yeah. Um, China and India, you, you seem to, you know, want to sort of educate us as to why those uh, situations are not uh, what we sometimes think that they are. Finland, you seem to be kind of positive about. Is that your end conclusion that we have a lot to learn from Finland? Yeah. Um, so if I if I may start with Finland part, I think there. I, I spoke with Pasi Salberg a number of times. He is the um, minister. I think the minister of education at C at CIMO um, in Finland. So that's a um, important consulate over there. And I think there are a number of lessons to learn from Finland in the sense that they don't. They have very little standardized testing. They support their teachers. They pay them well. There is a selective process. Um, and in school, kids are playing. They, they, their teachers have 
don't have many restriction, uh, restrictions to follow, their guidelines to really abide by, and there's a lot of autonomy. So kids and, parents, uh, kids and teachers alike have that freedom and that opportunity to grow and not be tied down to any government policy. So I think there are a number of things to take from there. However, um, and I will um, emphasize that we cannot just um, we cannot just take their model and replace it here. But considering all the poverty we have, all the socio socioeconomic issues we um, face, it just is not possible. But we can extract the best lessons from them and apply them here. It's very possible. So in Finland, there's this history, right, of um, kind, of, kind of how they went through this change and the length of time that it took. Has Finland been kind of a model for you? Yeah, it's it's one model, but I think we can do even better than Finland. Um, we can, I mean, there there's so many great uh, pockets of education in America, and that are even better than Finland. Uh, Finland is just at the tipping point. I think we can we can start with their model and even we can go even further than that because it's so it's it, make, it makes me it makes my mind boggle how many how much better we can do than how much better we can really change the system than Finland because um, Finland of course it, it's a great model but once you start really treating kids like adults you give them that personal autonomy um, and and allow them to grow in many ways you you change the system dramatically um, and once you understand the word trust, that's one word I keep hampering on, trust. When kids, teachers, and parents trust each other, when they think that kids are natural learners, that's when you change the dial of the conversation. But it does feel like the, the political process of getting to change in Finland is in and of itself, outside of the pedagogy, kind of an interesting one for you to be looking at. If you're looking at um, starting something that would help to change at a political level, Yeah, um, I think there, what Finland did, especially um, in their history, is that people came together because they realized that the economy was tanking, they were just getting out of um, the Soviet Union, and, tree, and their trees really weren't going to help them get out of this economic collapse. Um, so they believe education was one of their first ways to do that. Um, and the United States, I'm telling you, if, if, you, if they change their education system today, the economy will be hundreds and thousands of times better than it is um, in the next few years. So um, it, it does take some politicians' um, wit, really, to understand what's going on. And I wish more politicians and congressmen in the United States would go to Finland and realize this is possible here, even with all the poverty and um, socioeconomic conditions. So given that uh, President Obama and Mitt Romney are both due to speak tomorrow at Education Nation, uh, and we can hope, right? But have you heard from anybody of political stature here who's um, giving the same message that you are, where you, where you really feel that we should be supporting that particular politician in their uh, determinations to, to rethink schooling? I mean, I haven't heard anybody. I really, I don't, I, remind me, I don't, I don't think there's anybody that I've mentioned that can that is really said. This is how we should be doing schooling on the national scale. Um, every almost every single secretary of education we've had will not agree with the, the, the principles um, most of the people in this room would agree with, um, because it just doesn't abide by their by their ideologies. Because um, one thing I do have to point out is that President Obama secretly supports many of the ideas I have. Um, he said in many in many speeches and for example, the State of the Union, that we shouldn't be teaching to the test, we should be teaching with creativity and passion. Um, and for example, he talks about his, his daughters at, the, at, at their private school, and he said that they're not tested that much, they're only giving a test um, very once in a while, and they don't even have to study for it, so there's really no test prep. Um, but the irony is, is that all his policy, policies at the Department of Education um, contradict those opinions of his. Um, so I think deep down, President Obama really understands that there is something truly wrong, but I don't really understand why he won't act on it. 
Yes, the, you, you've asked the question I think many of us have. Okay, so you have a chapter called uh, Corporate Sugar Daddies. Tell us about that because it certainly feels as though you, you're um, really concerned about corporate influence. Yeah, um, so I think and uh, br bringing it right back to um, Education Nation, almost every single um, panel was dominated by this corporate influence. So that means um, the Gates Foundation, Kellogg, University of Phoenix, um, and I can go on for a long time. They're all taking what you call the corporate takeover of education. So there's a book out there. It's, it's by Stephen Brill, uh, Class Warfare. And he documents um, the struggle of teachers' unions and the corporate reform movement. So it's, he talks about how they support charter schools and more testing, et cetera. So I think it's very harmful because not only do many of them have many of them ever stepped into a public school, but they send their school, their, their, own, their own children to private institutions. They will not send their own children to the schools they prescribe for other children. Um, Rahm Emanuel, perfect example, uh, mayor of Chicago. He will not send his children to the public school system. He'll send them to a private school that doesn't even support tying teacher pay to test scores or testing very much. Um, but that school supports educating the whole child. So that's a huge point to make that these politicians will not even put their own personal, um, own children into the schools um, that the policies they dictate. So Deb Vane is correcting me. Did Obama and uh, Romney already speak? Um, no, Romney is speaking tomorrow live. President Obama will be speaking on the Today Show. I think that was a taped interview um, a few days ago. Okay, okay terrific. Um, Okay, so tell us a little bit about um, innovation and how you would foster innovation. In general? In general. I mean, uh, Tony Wagner did come on the show and he talked about innovation. And there's this tension between the idea that you can teach innovation or that you allow for experiences, making mistakes, and um, you know, opportunities to learn that would foster innovation, but that it's not something you can teach directly. So where do you come down on that? Yeah, I, I definitely think um, you, can, you can teach creativity. Um, let me, let me uh, demonstrate the difference between creativity and innovation. Creativity is the combination of divergent and convergent thinking. Um, so that's just thinking a lot of different ideas. It's, it's more than just imagination, where it really is not very practical. Innovation is putting those ideas into practice. So these are the products you see, the Apple iPhone, um, different, different gadgets and, and, um, and software that's coming out. I mean, there's, there's a lot of innovation in this country. So I think the best way, for example, to teach creativity is, to, is simply to follow what John Dewey said, learn by doing, um, and let kids explore. Let them ex um, expose them to as many possibilities as possible. Because if you look at the statistics um, of the Torrance test, which is um, a pretty good measure of creativity, the scores on it have decreased dramatically in the past decade, um, while standardized testing has increased by hundredfold or even more in this country. So, um, and many studies have shown that kid, almost every child has tested at the highest level of, level of divergent thinking, yet after they go through years of formal education, only less than 2% actually um, or at that level. So we, we literally do kill it out of kids, as Sorkin Robinson has said. We squash it, we, we, we pounce on it because we, we, we favor answers rather than asking good questions. We don't like to be skeptical, we just like to take things at face value in school. There's also been a running debate on this show, and it was intriguing to me that you actually kind of went to this place in, in a proactive way. But the debate has been about how much uh, industry and uh, are sort of the current drivers of our economy have valued compliance and uh, how much would they be willing to support an education that really created independence and independence of thinking. Do you want to describe your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so you're referring to the companies and corporations as well? Yeah, it does take us back a little to the previous chapter, but um, yeah. but it certainly feels as though 
you know, along with innovation, are, you know, sort of is independent thinking and creativity. And while companies say they want that, uh, it does feel as though the sort of the existing structure of our society is not going to be too excited about the kind of change that might take place. Yeah, no, that's a really great question and a nice tie-in with um, what I was saying before. And I think um, a lot of companies, there are studies out there that creativity is one of the most important skills to have. Being creative is one of the most important skills in the 21st century workplace. So you'll see that now that we have more startups coming about um, in technology and, and energy um, and education, so people want creative workers. And I know, for example, that a lot of startups will not hire a person if they have a very poor portfolio. They will hire people, even though they don't have a degree, but they show a large amount of real-world experience, and they've actually accomplished something in some type of form. So um, there really, there's a shift occurring because, yes, there's that corporate America is really staying in this mindset, but um, a lot of these new companies that are springing about, they, most of them don't care whether you've gone through, through, through the traditional ranks. They want to see you be able to solve problems, take risks, and... Um, really think beyond in, um, everyone else. So there is a session that starts right after this interview um, coming up. It's the um, Zach Malamed Student Voices panel. So we're going to have to finish yes. on time. But what I want to do is give people a chance to ask you questions. Uh, I know we've been, you know, we did the, the interview was fairly shortened because of the technical difficulties at the beginning. While people are thinking of questions, and I'll gather them in the chat and feed them to you, uh, or you can see them yourself. I did want to ask sort of how, you, how you're thinking about reinventing curriculum, because a big part of the end of the book is what you think we ought to be doing in our curriculum. Yeah. So um, most of what we learn, at least in the curriculum, is an utter waste of time. Um, and I talk about, for example, literature. It's great. You should, you, sh you should definitely be exposed to it, but we shouldn't make it mandatory. Learning Shakespeare, um, and Homer, for example. Um, talk about chemistry. Not every kid is going to be a chemist. We should expose it, but we shouldn't make it mandatory. Um, that can go on for a while. We should have a comprehensive general list or, or um, discourse of what we, every kid should know to become a good citizen. So that means um, understanding U.S. history, how civics works, learn how to, learning how to be a voter, um, basic statistics and probability, taking, taking risks, um, learning how to program. That's going to be a, such an important skill in the next decade and in the years ahead. Um, what Kathy Davidson calls it the next R, uh, the fourth R, um, where she calls it um, algorithms. And I think that's so, so important to look at because um, there's so many different skills. You need to have a basic science, literacy, scientific literacy and health um, and we should be really understanding what goes on to become a, a true citizen. So bridging from that, I also talk about a number of schools that are reinventing the curriculum. Um, MIT Media Lab, the Stanford D School, the Brightwork School in San Francisco, and there's so many more. Um, and what they do is that instead of grouping kids and telling them to learn subjects like English class, math class, they focus on projects and something called ARCs, at least in Brightworks. So for seven, eight weeks, they focus on a topic like cities. And they look at every single aspect of the politics, the, uh, the geography, um, the architecture. And they, look at, they, they form projects from this and find mentors and um, go on field trips. And this is the best way to excite their passion and their, the love of learning because they're intrinsically motivi motivated by this. Um, and it, it's so much more valuable, such so, so, such a more valuable learning experience than telling kids just learn this in this isolated way in a silo. Um, and it, what, another thing to point out is that in, these, in this curriculum, the teacher is more of a guide. They're a facilitator. They're on the side. Um, and what Diane Laufenberg um, call, uh, told, it, told me um, is an architect of opportunity. So they're creating these experiences and making sure that we're right on the same path. Um, so I think that's very important to note. So you talk in the book about, you say that nobody ever asked you what your passions were. There's kind of a delicate interplay between passions and um, time spent on things. 
And sometimes passions come out of the things that we focus on, and sometimes they precede them. Um, sort of in your own case, do you feel that your passions were the result of kind of innate tendencies you had, or did they develop as you began to be uh, working specifically on certain things? Yeah, I think they, I mean, I, I was always really interested in reading. So my mother really exposed me to a lot of different types of books, and that really started my love for learning. And then it really went from there. So um, my love for politics, it really started with, the 2004 election, one night my dad took me, I mean, he took me to the voting booth a lot, and he, he showed me um, when, when the polls were coming in, John Kerry and, and George Bush, and that really excited me a lot. Um, I was so fascinated by that, and from there on, um, that was 2004, I started getting more information and understanding about politics, and then everything really started to come together in 2008 when I read President Obama's book. Um, so I was so started to get so fascinated by the political process, and I wanted to be a part of it, um, yet I wasn't even exposed to it at school. I just started to do it on my own, read books, and follow the news every day. Okay, so we're talking to Nikhil Goyal, and the book is One Size Does Not Fit All. We have a couple of more minutes, but uh, we're probably going to end right on the money and so that we can go to this uh, other student voice session. I'm going to put the link, the Blackbird Collaborate link to that session. We'll hope that the connection issues there uh, do not transfer. We do not transfer them from here to there. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, otherwise, uh, I just wanted to thank you, Nikhil, for, uh, for the book. I think it's really a fascinating read, and obviously you spent an enormous amount of time on it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. <laughs> what a disaster those first 15 minutes were. If you suffered through those, you deserve a, a badge of honor, everybody in the room who's here. <laughs> please do consider ordering it. It's wh wh Where is it currently in an Amazon rank? Um, it, it just keeps shifting. So it's on Amazon. It's on, it should be on, Bar it's on Barnes & Noble. So you can get it on Kindle or the Nook or paperback. Oh, good. Well, I'll ask one more question if we don't have a question from the chat. Uh, how many children in your family? Um, I have a, a younger sister. A younger sister. Is she, is she as interested in this as you are? How, how much younger is she? Um, she's 14, um, but she's, I, don't, I don't think she's as interested <laughs> as me. <laughs> I'm, I'm the crazy kid in the family. It is interesting to see how uh, different children have different interests and talents. Um, how have your parents responded to this, to the book, and to your sort of passionate interest? Um, they've supported me in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, even though they are very traditional in their thinking, um, they've been on my side, they've helped me out, um, and they, they really, I mean, without them, I don't think I'd be here right now because considering all the guidance they've been giving me, um, and I think that was just pivotal to everything I've been doing. Did you continue to go to school as you were writing the book? Were those concurrent, or did you take time off? No, I was in school the entire time. So how did you do that? Um, interesting story. Um, so I used to finish all my homework during school. Um, so I try to finish everything like during class and read the news during class on my Kindle um, secretly, secretly. And then when I got home after running running track and everything, I would just start writing and just research and do interviews. So it was it was a very busy year, but um, I did most of the back, um, background work, so the framework of the book um, that summer. But, so I just need to pound away and write. Well, you did a terrific job. Okay, thanks, Nikhil. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We are going to let you switch. I'll put that link in again for the student panel, student voice panel, if you're interested. Tomorrow night on the future of education, making thinking visible. Then Wednesday, the true history of the MOOC. Have a great night. Nikhil, thanks for being patient. No, thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye now.